Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept us a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman wait for the morning, more than the watchman wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And our New Testament reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. All righty, well, today we're going on with our look at the letter to the Romans. We come now to chapter 5. And, of course, this is all in context. We've got to remember where we've just come from, which is talking about how Abraham, no matter what else we can say about Abraham, we have to say that Abraham was an imperfect person, and yet he was justified before God through faith and not through his own actions. And, uh, and he was reckoned as right with God because of something God did for him. And all he did was receive what God was giving, and that was considered the right response of faith. That's how faith works. Faith receives what God is giving. Faith doesn't climb the mountain to get God and bring him down. Rather, faith receives the God who has stepped off the mountain and come down to us. And that's the difference. And that's the kind of context we have to understand it. And then what Paul then wants to go on to say is, because of this, therefore we have not only the faith of Abraham, but we also have a hope. A hope which cannot be messed up by anything that's going on around us. Now, I remember some time ago, back in uh, 2005, um, I had a physiotherapist for a year after having a nasty car crash in India. And my physiotherapist said to me that my recovery time could be cut in half if I have hope. That is, if I have a goal at the end of my time of recovery, something that I really want to do and look forward to, if I maintain that hope, then it will, it could up to, up to half the time that I would spend needing physiotherapy. And I didn't like my physiotherapist a lot, I've got to be honest with you. He used to seem, he seemed to me to have a certain kind of delight in hurting me. He's actually a personal friend of mine, my physiotherapist. And uh, not anymore, of course, but, but I, I actually sent him a card uh, at the end thanking him, but also saying that he had a mean streak in him that was so wide it could be seen from space. <laughs> but so I was pretty keen to get well, I can tell you. And so what I maintained in my mind's eye was going into the, the tour down under uh, fun uh, ride, which is around about 150 kilometres which even when I was well, that was, a, that was a hard ride. But I decided that was going to be my goal. That's what I was going to do. I'm going to recover and I'm going to ride the TDU and do the 150 Ks. It doesn't matter whether I come last, just the fact that I do it, that's all that I cared about. And two years later, 
I did it. But that's not the, the you know, I, that's neither here nor there. What, what, what counts though is that I had a reason to get better. And having, a, having something to look forward to makes all the difference in the world. And that's the dynamic of hope. And the stronger, of course, your hope, the, the greater the capacity that it gives you to overcome whatever it is that you're going through. And you probably heard it said that where there's life, there's hope. But I believe the opposite is even truer, which is to say that where there's hope, there's life. Because even if you just, I mean, there are plenty of people who are living and breathing, but who have no hope. And their living and breathing is almost pointless. Um, better to have a strong hope than to have a long life. And so uh, this is the kind of thing that I believe is in Paul's mind when he, he's writing what he's writing here. But what he wants to say is that this hope that he's talking about isn't temporary hope. It's a ultimate hope. And it's much bigger than any of the temporary hopes we might have. So that's why, and, and the reason for the hope, he says at the, in verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and of course that's referring back to Abraham, saying in the same way that Abraham was justified by faith, not because of his good works, it's been reckoned to him, counted as if he, is, he has fulfilled the law, even though he hasn't. It's been reckoned to him. That's actually a, a technical term. It's a little bit like uh, when... They play cricket and somebody does a cover drive and hits a seagull. You ever seen that? I saw it once, I saw a seagull get killed by a cricket ball. And it was, you know, they had it in slow motion in three angles and they just kept playing it over and over again. And my bird watching sensibilities were. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was reckoned as a four, even though it didn't make it to the cut, to the, to the, it was counted as a four, even though it didn't get there. And that's the kind of thing that Paul was trying to say in chapter 4, is that the life of Abraham was counted as a four, even though it never got to the fence because of what God had done for him. And he simply received that. And, and so he says, therefore, since we have been justified with that same kind of faith, therefore, that, what that means is we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. So the doorway into grace is simply a gift. And you're standing in the grace of God and you have peace with God and you can approach God because your sins are forgiven through faith. It's, I mean, it's, you know, it's the classic story doesn't seem to matter how many times you've heard it. We see, still seem to need to be reminded over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because our default setting keeps going back to I've got to earn my way. If it is to be, it's up to me. And then we, you know, we run out of steam on that and find ourselves winding back to having to realise the only way that we can have peace with God is by what God has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ. So that's the, you know, we all know that, but there it is. We have to say it again. And so that's, he said, that's where we're standing. And then he goes on to say, and it's almost like he's saying, and because of this, in, in this place, therefore, we can boast in the hope of the glory of God. And what does that mean? That's a strange kind of a sentence. Boasting in the hope of the glory of God. So let's explain that. Um, Again, remembering the context of Abraham, he's saying that uh, we have the same faith as Abraham, but we also share, therefore, in the same hope, which is this, that we will one day look on the face of God. The hope of glory is not, um, I mean, we use this word, you know, I've written a whole book on glory, by the way, so I should know a little bit about this, but... Um, the, the glory of something is the essential nature of something, seen at its fullest and best. So the glory, say, of God is what? And where do you see the glory of God at its fullest and best? Well, who, re who reveals God the most? Jesus. I mean, he is God, but he's, he's God become a man. And in the sonship and the humanity of Jesus Christ, 
we have a revelation of the nature of God. And if you had to boil it all down, the nature of God is seen in his love. The love of the Father to the Son, and the Son to the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the joy, and the, and the reciprocity, and all of that stuff that's going on between the Father, Son, and Spirit has been going on before creation, and God's glory was already in place long before anyone observed it. it, it un, unobserved glory is still glorious. You know, there are plenty of flowers out there in the bush right now. There's these beautiful Australian native orchids, which are putting on an incredible show, and no one's seeing it. Well, God's seeing it, and it's, it's there for his pleasure, but he actually wants us to share in the pleasure as well. And the, the pleasure and the joy and the glory of God the Father, Son and Spirit was enough for them as it was, but he actually wanted more people to be involved. He wanted a family. He wanted children. He wanted us. And he wanted us to be involved and he wanted us to share in their glory and to know their glory. And that's the glory that Paul is talking about there. He's saying that we boast because we are put right with God and we have peace with God. Therefore, we have a hope. And the hope is that we will share in the glory of God and know his glory and see him as he is. And if we see him as he is, then we will become what we are. The more you see God as he is, the more you become yourself. The closer you get to God, the more you become you. You know, a lot of religions, they, they have this idea that the closer you get to God, the less you become that you disappear, you just become a, a drop in, in the divine ocean. But in Christian faith, it's quite the opposite. The closer you get to God, the more you become you. And the more glorious you become. Because the more you see God as he is, the more you become who you are. Because you are who you are in relation to God. Without God, you cannot be who you are truly meant to be. And a person who has become hopeless and faithless and loveless is a person who's detached from God or alienated from God, but a person who is connected to God, at peace with God, and walking towards God is becoming a fuller and better version of themselves. And one day you'll actually walk straight into the very middle of the glory of God and you'll see him face to face and you'll become fully yourself. And then you'll spend eternity being glorified and becoming more who you are because you'll see God more and more. And, and it's that hope which he's saying is the greatest of, greatest of all hopes and it is larger and better than any other hope you could possibly um, even think of. So, I mean, you might think that's a fairly grand statement you're making there, but Jesus said virtually the same in John 17, verse 23. He's praying to the Father and he said, sorry, verse 22, and he said... Um, I have given them, that's the disciples, the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Can you see, can you see what he's saying there? So he's saying, from eternity I've had glory with you, Father. I've known you, you've known me, we've been walking together, enjoying fellowship for eternity. And now you've allowed me to earth that in my humanity and to take that which you've given me and now I'm going to give it to them. The glory that you gave me, I'm going to give to them. And then in verse 23, he says, I in them and you in me. So in other words, he's saying, I am going to be in them and relating to them and connected to them in the same way that you are relating to me and connecting to me. Not only that, but as you are connecting with me, I'm taking what I have with you and bringing it and giving it to them. I mean, it sounds a little bit esoteric, but it's real. And, and, the, and the reason you can hope for that is not because you've somehow hacked your way in through the jungle into that reality, but rather God has made a way for you. And by faith you just receive it. And then hope is made alive. In fact, in verse 23 it goes on to say, Then the world would know that you have sent me, and you have loved them even as you have loved me. I always like to say that's obviously a misprint in your Bible, as if God would love us as much as he loves his son. But, you know, if the Bible and Jesus are anything to go by, I'll just throw that line out there. If, you know, if the Bible and Jesus are anything to go by, then that might be true. 
And, it's, and you see, it's true. It's, again, it's true not because of you. It's true because of what God has done in Christ. And so this hope, Paul is saying, is something you can boast in. You don't boast in yourself. You boast in what God has done for you. The boast of a believer is, look at what God has done to me. You know, the songs we sang this morning are virtually saying the same thing. You know, the first song, Amazing Grace, John Newton, you, you all know the story. His whole life is saying, I'm, I'm less than nobody. I'm the worst of the worst. And, but look what God has done to me. And back in the days when amazing used to mean something, used to mean something, he says, it's amazing grace. It's incredible. It's almost unbelievable. And here it is. Nevertheless, Paul goes on to say that, so we, so we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Just that verse alone should be enough to keep you going for the rest of your life. But he says that um, we boast in that. But we also, he says, not only so, but we glory in, or boast in if you like, we glory in our sufferings. Why would you glory in sufferings? He's not saying, oh, oh, oh great, more suffering. He's not saying that. But he's saying, but even in the face of suffering, because even when we suffer, suffering produces perseverance. And that's what I was alluding to before, that if you have a hope, it, en it enables you to persevere. It, it pushes, you can push through suffering if you have a reason to push through it. And so he is saying that, um, that we have uh, such a hope that even suffering will not tear it down, no matter what you suffer. Um, and I've got to say this, not all hopes are equal. We have lots of hopes in this life. All of them are, are there and they're legitimate hopes and they're important hopes. You know, for instance, I have hopes in my friendships, in my marriage, in my family, in my community, my country, for the world in general. And all of those are good hopes, legitimate hopes, some of them are even noble hopes. But every one of those hopes is less than ultimate and will not prove to be greater than anything that life can throw. Because it doesn't matter how much I hope that I'll be able to enjoy a particular friendship forever, one day, one of us is going to die. So that's got a, that's got a use by date on it. And it doesn't matter how long I live, if I live long enough, I will still die. And so death kind of, kind of comes and tears a hole in all of our hopes. And, and Puts a, you know, has a use-by date on all, all of our hopes. Um, and so every hope we have, you know, like I hope to be healthy. This last week I haven't been. I felt like my head's been in a vice all week. But, as it, and it's good to hope for that. And if I hope for it, I'm actually going to be healthier. But one day, no matter what I do, It's like the guy who had on his uh, tombstone, I told you I was sick. <laughs> because it's, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how much I hope. I actually watched a, 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 an interview with some people who were called um, Eternals, who were on a TV show saying that they believed that they would never die. And because they believed they would never die, they never would. Um, I don't know how they're going with that. But I'm sure that their hope will be broken one day if it hasn't been already. And look, there's nothing wrong with those, what I would call, less than ultimate hopes. We need them. We need them for, a, the, you know, they, they, they have a purpose. They have a purpose in this life. But then at the end of the day, you've, got to, you've always got to get down to it and, 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 and get, uh, and I've always been a bottom line sort of person, just read to the end of the page and then you die. Well, what about that? If, if that's it, I mean, that means that if, that, if that's it, then, it's, then life is actually meaningless, isn't it, really? 
and all hopes are proved to be vain at some level, unless, of course, you can get past death. If death can't destroy hope, or the hope, the greatest of hopes, then they can re-legitimise other hopes. But if death is the last word, then all hopes are pointless. But what Paul is saying is that we have a hope, we have the hope of the glory of God, and that hope is stronger and greater than even death. I mean, it would be like fishing with a fishing line that's unbreakable. Um, you know, fishing line has a test strength on it. You buy a spool of line, and on the side of the, it has, uh, this is 10 pound line, or five kilogram line, or whatever it might be. And when a line gets stretched to that breaking strain, it'll break. And I've had plenty of experience of breaking fishing line with big fish on it. Um, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, people, when I go fishing, they say, oh, I suppose you're going to tell me a story about the big one that got away. And I said, yeah, it happens all the time. That's why it's interesting. Occasionally, you get the big one doesn't get away, and it's quite, a, quite an amazing thing. But imagine if you could go fishing, and you had line and a hook. It didn't matter how big the fish was, every time you hooked it, you always landed the fish. Because you get pretty nonchalant about whether it's going to get away, you wouldn't be, there would be no tension. I mean, part of the tension and the excitement of fishing, I know you're thinking, I can't believe that you would think that fishing is interesting, but, but the, it's the thrill of the hunt and the fact that you, you are likely to fail that actually makes it amazing when you don't. So, but if you were hooking fish and it didn't matter what the fish did, it could go under a rock or it could, it could stretch it to its maximum extent and it never broke. Eventually you start thinking, wow, this line is amazing. And you start to have a hope in it that it would never break. And that's the kind of thing that Paul is saying here. We have the hope of glory, which is a hope that cannot be broken, not even by death. Imagine that. So suffering comes and it, it, it stretches all of our hopes and it determines the test strength of every one of our hopes. And, you know, for instance, it shows us that uh, political hopes, for instance, have a certain level. You know, I, I have hopes in democracy. But democracy, even democracy, doesn't really ultimately cut it, not like the kingdom of God does. Or I have hopes in my family, but one day I'm going to die, and so on. And all of these hopes have a test strength and they break, but the hope of glory never breaks. Nothing can break it, and it just keeps on keeping on. And so, um, in the end, in fact, suffering will end. Suffering and death will end before the hope of glory does. And it will outlast everything that's thrown at it. And that's exactly why Paul goes on to say, therefore, that um, not only so, but we rejoice, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, you see, once perseverance has run its course, then it produces character, and then character produces even more hope. So what he's saying there is that the, the suffering that we go through, which then, in, then causes us to have to go through endurance or perseverance, once we've gone through it, we realise that this hope doesn't break, and it reveals the character of that hope. It shows it to be unbreakable and reveals the nature of that hope as being having a character what that the word character there means something like uh, proven substance it proves your hope I mean, it's one thing to have a hope but if you never test it then you never know whether it's worth having it's a bit like um, my son was saying to me you know I was, I was I may have been talking to him about what are you going to do with your life? It's time for you to start thinking about the future. One of those, you know, one of those conversations parents have with their children. And also it's about time you live, live somewhere else, but whatever. <laughs> he's 27. He's still at home. 
still, whatever. He'll be watching this later, so I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> or should I? Hmm. Anyway, we're, we're, there was a point there. Yeah, he, he said, I, and I said, you've got so much potential. And he said, yeah, but potential is great. As long as you don't touch it, it remains there. <laughs> but the moment you put your potential out there, it, it, a lot of it can evaporate pretty quickly, can't it? And I think people do that with, with hope. It's one thing to have hope, but if you never let it be tested, you never know what it's going to be worth. And the thing is, all your hopes are going to be invaded anyway. You can sit there and just, and like a chook sitting on eggs, sit on your hopes and never let them be touched. But one day, despair is going to reach in and grab those eggs and crush them anyway. Doesn't matter what you do. So they are going to be tested. So you might as well just let it happen. And what, but what Paul is saying is, when you suffer, the hope of glory is not destroyed. And therefore it reveals the character of it, the unbreakable nature of it, and therefore your, what the, the end effect is, even more hope. Does, it, does that make sense? So no matter what you suffer, suffering doesn't destroy this hope, it actually bolsters it. Because it survives. Whereas other hopes are sidelined or diminished, or in some cases even destroyed. And I've got to say, that has been the testimony of my own life and the lives of many, many others and people in this room I've talked to. I know people in this room have suffered tragedy and all kinds of things which I hardly even want to even bring back to memory, but there it is. And yet I see people who have this astonishing, joyful hope, despite everything, if you know what I mean. I mean, anyone can say God is good when life is good, but when people, the same sort of people say that God is good when life isn't good, then they know something that maybe someone else doesn't. Maybe there's something else going on. And that maybe is the hope of glory, I believe. Even if you don't fully understand the theology of it, it doesn't matter. It, it, it still affects you. And it's transforming you. And I've got to say... The moment that the hope of glory was instilled in me was the same day that I became a believer, and the day I became a believer was actually someone re was actually preaching from Romans five, chapter, verse one. It was a the well-known preacher was preaching. Therefore, since we have been justified through through faith, we have peace with God. And as that was being proclaimed, I believed it, and I received the Holy Spirit. I repented. I had faith. The whole thing happened like that. And I'd spent years and years and years fearing God and not knowing God and trying to earn my way. And then in an instant, I suddenly realised and, and I've got, I can honestly say from that day forward, I've, I've had hope. A hope which is undiminished by my own stupidity or by suffering or by anything anyone's done to me because... It's bigger and better than anything you'll suffer in this life. Uh, you know, I have my good days and bad days and so on. Like Paul said, we are crushed, but we're not destroyed. We are hard-pressed. We're pulled down, but we get up again. And why? Because of this hope. It's not destroyed by the suffering we experience. And so, he, and then he, he wraps it all up in this, this passage saying... Uh, in verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love is being poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And in another version it says, this hope does not disappoint. It doesn't leave us. Um, it doesn't over-promise and under-deliver. But you know, a, lot of, a lot of advertising, for instance, it tries to create hope in the product or whatever it is, but it usually over promises and under delivers. And it does annoy me sometimes when Christians preach in a way that if you believe in God, then all your life will just be a bed of roses and all that sort of thing, because that's just ridiculous. The Bible doesn't say that, by the way. The Bible says no matter what, the hope of glory is there, but it doesn't doesn't deliver you from the, no, from the no matter what's. They're going to happen anyway. 
And so, uh, but, this, but this hope never disappoints. And, and it never disappoints because it keeps on going on in spite of everything. But it's not just a, an intellectual thing. It's a spirit thing. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so we experience something of the, of the glory that we will fully experience later. We get a, a taster of it here and now. That's what he's saying. And as I often say about the communion, the communion is a little bit like um, the spies being sent to the promised land and they bring back the fruit and the, and, the, and the milk and the honey from the promised land and they ate that milk and honey in the, in the desert. They weren't in the promised land, but they had a taste of it. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, while we are in this broken world, under the, the ghastly thrall of death and suffering, while we're in that place, we get a little bit of a taste of glory before we actually experience it. Or as Paul puts it elsewhere in the book of Ephesians, he says, we have the earnest of things to come, or if you like, the engagement ring before we get married. So we have a taste of something before we get there. And so, um, and again, if I go back to an analogy from fishing, you know, when, um, when an angler hooks a big fish, they're always keen to know whether they've got a, or well, if you're out in a boat, out in the, Back in the days when you used to be allowed to fish for snapper, there's a ban on snapper fishing at the moment for three years because commercial fishermen have overfished them and just about extincted them. Um, very short-sightedness, anyway. And there's bribes and all that sort of thing going on, but whatever. Um, but back in the day, you used to be able to go out in a boat and fish for snapper. Of course, snapper are beautiful big pink fish that taste fantastic and look great and fight really well. But uh, small bronze whalers are also very common in those same places, not so much good to eat and not very highly prized. And so when you hook a fish, you're keen to know what you've hooked. Have I hooked a shark or have I got a snapper? And so you look over the side and what you're looking for is a flash of silvery pink. And if you get the flash of silvery pink, it, you know, your heartbeat goes up. Oh, I've hooked a snapper. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives us a flash of silvery pink before we actually get the fish in the boat. And the flash of silvery pink that you actually get is you get a piece of the glory now. You experience the love of the Father in the Son and the Son steps inside of you by the Holy Spirit and shares his relationship with the Father with you here and now, even before you get to stand in glory. And yet you get a taste of it. And I've got to say, the Christian faith isn't just, you know, some stuff written in a book and 10 things you need to know about Jesus or 64 uh, ethical, ethical things you should be doing and, um, and a theology book. Because if that's all it is, it's not just a propositional position or a philosophical idea. It's a living, spiritual, relational reality which really is the thing that drives the Christian faith. I mean, you know, people like me get into all that stuff. But I do get feedback. That really, the thing that drives the Christian faith is the love of God. And that love is not just a concept, it's a reality. And the Holy Spirit has been poured out into our hearts. And we get to experience the milk and the honey from the promised land here and now. So it's not just pie in the sky when you die, it's meat on your plate while you wait. <laughs> you get to experience the reality, not the fullness of it, it's, a, it's only a taster, it's only a, you know, it's kind of a hors d'oeuvres before the main meal. But boy, I've had times when the love of God has been so profound and so real, it's nearly stopped my heart. And I think, well, if this is just a taster, What's the real thing going to be like? And I have no clue. All I know is it's going to be good. And nothing, not even my own stupidity, not, 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 not tragedy or trauma or anything that, nothing, as Paul goes on later to say, nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
Not things in the past, nor things in the future, nor things present, nor angels or demons or any other power. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And even if you feel like you're separated from the love of God, the truth is that you have been put right with God in Jesus Christ. Amen.